and we're live. Welcome back for another episode, Are people. You sure Thank you for. Yeah, I'm kind of sure. I mean, it says we're live. The little dig- Duma Hickey's doing its doodad thing. No, it's right? live. That's a scientific name for it, by the way. No, no. Uh, so, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the bl- Ooh, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. Uh, the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So, without further ado, we're going to let our guest, Mr. John Ford, introduce himself to our listeners and viewers. Yes, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John Ford. I'm a new author in, in the science fiction genre. is my uh, most recent endeavor, and uh, I would actually qualify the work as hard science fiction. I'm sure that uh, your fans must know sort of the difference between soft science fiction, hard science fiction, and fantasy, because those of us who are writing uh, tend to, you know you know, know about these sort of niches, if you will. So my story uh, that you see in the cover there, Dominion, um, takes place uh, roughly current period, I would say. Um, It deals with uh, recent technology and then taking visions of that technology and extrapolating a story from real science. It marriages from three disciplines, uh, one is biology, the next is solid state physics, and the third is, you know, I would say psychology, but it actually it has a very spiritual sort of ramification or overtone to it. Um, you know, I don't want to give it away or anything. And um, so it's sort of a unique, it's a unique, um, it's a unique take on things because it tries to really draw from those real science uh, science values and then synthesize a story from that um, that deals with technology that we commonly use and uh, fear and in some cases are in awe over which is artificial intelligence and drones um, and those kinds of technology so yeah that's um, that's sort of an introduction to me and then the work that you, that I'm presenting here tonight for your show um, All hopefully. right, and then the next part of the introduction, dear listeners, how we found them, and this one came to us via the circuitous route known as his publicist, who reached <laughs> out, and it sounded interesting when he gave the blurb, so I said, oh, okay, we'll do this, and uh, and here we are, but before we get started, Doc, are you ready to do the infamous religion questions? Um, I am ready. The question is, are you guys ready? So I was born ready, Doc. I was born ready. Really? Is that why you're always so late? Sure. So, Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly, which one is your religion? Star Trek. Nice. Uh, Preferably the ones since, including and since generation. I, you know, I do like the campier versions of the early 1960s because, you know, it sort of reflected the science fiction vision of the day. Space travel is going to be very new. I mean, so it's uh, it's always fun to go back there. But by the time that late '80s had come around, it had a little bit more. Ah, uh, you know, it's hard to stay realistic because you're traveling at warp speed and so forth, and doing all this other other jazz with technology that it seems indistinguishable from magic, if I may borrow from Arthur C. Clarke. And um, but still, it seemed a little bit, you know. A little more realistic with it. Maybe it's the special effects and how that synthesizes with the cinema and so forth. And the writing was also superb. They did a really, really good job writing the science fiction. I saw a really fascinating documentary on the writing of those episodes for for the science fiction, you know, for the dialogue and so forth. So, you know, it might just be a response to being like kind of spoiled, you know what I mean? <laughs> spoiled by modern science. And having having the advantage of like three decades of space travel as a citizen uh, and observance to work with, you know, so those. But I think that that's just a function of the science fiction vision maturing with the with the culture. So, yeah. yeah. But that's the short answer. The short answer to your question is uh, Star Trek. And it's, you know, I since then um, I even like the Picard series that have been lately on some of these <laughs> giving a little bit. You know, giving a little away there, but um, 
Yeah, great stuff. <laughs> okay. So how about fantasy? Because we do do the polytheistic thing here. Game of Thrones, Wheel of Time, or Conan the Barbarian? I'm not familiar with Wheel of Time, so I guess I would default to Game of Thrones. Um, I do like the um, Lord of the Rings series, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and there's kind of like a Middle-earth quality to Game of Thrones there. So. Well, you can always pick uh, game uh, Lord of the Rings instead of Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah. I mean, if I were going to go fantasy, you know what would be really cool is some kind of mashup between Star Wars and, and Lord of the Rings. That would be, like, really cool. Because I don't think of Star Wars as fi science fiction, by the way. I think of that as more fantasy uh, because, you know. I think as a, it's a tool to emotionally beat up me with. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get beat up myself by uh, making a statement. No, 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 no. He just gets emotionally beat up. He gets so hopeful and then. You know, he always yeah. his ego gets so crushed when, um, well, he finally is done with the Star Wars movies. Well, that's the thing about Dominion, the story of Dominion, is that it has a little bit of that, um, you know, kind of use the force thing with it. I mean, it's, I mean, it, it, it touches on a psionic, psionic um, aspect, which is, as you know, communication through telepathy, mm -hmm. and it, but, it, but it explains why that might happen. An advanced AI in a, in a really particular way um, and how it manifests. And that's, that's the kind of that angle, the story that gets more to sort of into the transcendental, if you will. Um, I love science fiction that has a hard canvas of science, but then has that sort of overarching vision floating over the top of it. You know, the juxtaposition between the discrete and concrete science and the you know, the ramifications being out, out, out and it so forth is like, that's like the good stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but you see that, you'll get that in like Star Trek The Next Generation, right? Because, you know, they're, they're using all this science, which is pretty much impossible by current technology, to warping into some place where these beings have all these special powers, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And right. which was your first love, though? Science fiction or fantasy? Science fiction. Well, you know what? Let's come to an accord on this. My f favorite, most favorite uh, movie of all time came out when I was seven years old. And it was called, I just dated myself viciously there, but it's called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, it was released in 1977. And I've seen that movie probably, you know, 24 times in my life, and it's still, like, the best movie I've ever seen. I mean, it was really fantastically well done. And that's a perfect example of that, you know, technology. And, the you know, it had aliens and the technology that they came in, and they communicated with the, with people and sort of uh, psychically, if you will, and draw, drew them to the Devil's, Devil's Tower a mon a monument out there in Wyoming. And, you know, where the rendezvous would ha happen towards the end of the movie and so forth. So that movie is science fiction, um, but it kind of has, um, because of that, that psychic thing, it kind of has some of that fantasy stuff with it, you know. So I don't know. I guess the short answer to your question, just science fiction would be my first love. <laughs> Which is what you're writing. So that's very awesome. Yeah. yeah well, you know, it's funny. Um I was never a writer growing up. I, I read the science fiction classics like the Asimov series, the fund, Foundation series. I read, I read the you know the mainstream guys like Clark, Arthur C. Clarke, and Pornell, and Niven, um, and, and so and their some of their works like Lucifer's Hammer and Footfall, you know. And I never really got into writing until I was more of an adult. And this is going to sound really crazy, but it was the email era. The age of the email came around in the late 90s, right? And I started communicating through email and I was talking. And as I just was writing and writing and writing, people started telling me, John, you should try writing a book or a story or something. You just have a way with words and your vocabulary and, you know, throwing accolades at me that I never expected. I never really thought much of it. And then, um, I don't know, it just hit me one day when I was 
um, listening to NPR when I heard them talking about these microtubules, which are real in biology, by the way, in the human, um, in the neuro tapestry of the human mind. And it just hit me that I, that I can write a story about this. I know what those are. And unlike what's really interesting is that, so I started putting that into words and I wrote this story about it. And um, this was my first to try attempt at actually being published was this book. I don't, you know, so I wrote this, this novel and it, they liked it right away. Maybe, you know, I credit a lot of that to just because of its relevancy right now, that it has to do with AI, it has to do, it has drones in it. You know, there's a lot of vehicles in the plot that are really common right now with what's going on in the world. So, you know, I can't take total credit for that vision, but, you know, art reflects life, as they say, right? It so, does. It does. Yeah. So that's really awesome. But what is it that really that you love about speculative fiction? I, I like the speculation process. Could this really happen? I love the wonder if it's done right and it's done well, which I'm not claiming that that's what I did in the story, but it's hope that I achieve that. Then you should leave the scene wondering, ah, can that really happen? And it gives you that sense of awe. You know, that's my draw to it is that process. That's why when I watch a good science fiction movie or read a good science fiction book, it's usually the first 10 chapters of the story that I really am into because that's the development of it. Like what's, you know, that's the page turner stuff right there, <laughs> you know? Um, but it's that, it's the whole, it's, it's really the ability to leave the reader or myself when I'm watching, get a gathering in somebody else's art. If, if I'm actually left with that feeling of speculation, that vision of what could actually happen, you know, that's why, that's why I wrote probably in the hard science fiction, more so in the soft science fiction. Um, and actually, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's this uh, sci-fi punk kind of uh, subgenre as well. And that's a really good one too, because that's also very speculative and it has to do with how technology kind of feeds back on sociology and you can create these wonderful dystopian sort of landscapes that way um, based on, I mean, it's pretty easy to, to see how like human darkness gets in concert with technology and like it may not end well. So it's called cyberpunk actually is that genre. So um, oh, we've, we've had some cyberpunk authors on here. They have a, they have a fun time. They have some very uh, crazy book covers in some cases. So. Yeah, well, you know, if you want me to just describe that's an apparition, that's supposed to be an apparition. It was my idea to do this. And you can see the apparition is kind of coming out of the math equations that are sort of <laughs> there. And those are real, those are real math equations, by the way. There's I um, would never be able to solve them. I'm not even sure he knows what math is really. <laughs> Well, you know, as long as you recognize it, that it's something techy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's probably. See, I, know, I can recognize some of these. Did you spit? Did you pick specific equations that you wanted to represent? Yeah, I did. I, I used um, um, a little bit of thermodynamic equations in there. I mean, I can't remember I know exactly. I recognize one of those. Thermochemistry. <laughs> One of my favorite college professors was a thermochemist, my thermochemistry professor. So mm. thermodynamics was thermodynamics, so and there's there's I, there's some quantum there's some quantum field equations in there as well because the, yeah, no, I hated that class. I hated quantum. <laughs> quantum I, I, you know, I never got to take it. I I did like you know many levels of mathematics because I had to, I was a meteorologist actually that was, that's my native education so meteorology is all fluid flow dynamics equations like Navier Stokes and so forth and uh, you know learning PV equals RRT and then integrating that across you know fluid mechanics and you know oh man PV equals NRT P uh, PV the PV basics PV. of what you so need to know it's like one of the master equations in chemistry PV equals NRT, and there's variations on like PV equals and uh, like um, you can also just break that down to pressure, volume, and temperature too, depending on what kind of. Yeah, but know. the ends is the number of, of moles. Yeah, well, yeah, that's why you want that in meteorology, particularly because you're talking about atmospheric, you know, gas, 
gas constants and stuff with R as well. So we get, oh, yeah. No, we're good. totally losing JR. He's completely lost. <laughs> JR, are you still alive over there? Now that I, I am, but is this is this how you feel when I talk about history? <laughs> I don't know. Do you feel out of your depth? Because I don't feel out of my depth. I just feel bored. I, I don't. Well, I I just like I hear numbers and I just go to La La Land and like, oh look, shiny guns. Um. So so getting us oh, back on track. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I well, see. I was going to say, and you know, my story tries to marry. Um, what she and I, the kind of stuff that she and I are talking about with a common dialogue, which is difficult to do, I admit. I'm not sure. I'm hoping that that translates well in the book. There are scenes that are very tech and technically written, and then it's couched in there. Inside, there will be dialogue between the characters that's very more like you and I, how we're speaking now, you know? So to try and, yeah, well, you know. You, you can't keep it all so it's supposed to be hard science fiction. It's supposed to be story driven, not here. Let me give you a textbook with some characters in it. Right. Right. Well, I don't, yeah, I wouldn't want to, that's not a novel. Then you're writing some kind of like recipe, right? I mean, <laughs> hey, I love my lab procedures. <laughs> Is that what you, uh, you know, mind me asking, are you guys, um, are you folks? I think I read your bio. You're from a military, um, well, let's. I'll well, let Jr. and I both served in the military, but Jr. Okay. is broken, so he just does crazy stories and sells them to people as as fans, as fiction. Okay. So Jr. Jr. is an author, but I I do chemistry for fun and pay. So your your day job, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel bad. I'm uh, I'm actually my day job as uh, when I'm not writing. Um, I'm a software engineer, so um, more or less math than meteorology. <laughs> yeah, there's sort of a mathematical process to it, no, no question. But you know, software guys don't really like to solve equations. They usually just try to. They go to meetings and like take requests to draw orange houses with green pens. That's usually what <laughs> okay. you know. So, how did your well, you've talked about it a little bit, but when you got, okay, so you got the letters, the emails that say, hey, you really should try writing. But that's, you know, someone telling you that. That's like your English teacher saying, this is good, you should write. What made you decide to take that sort of nudge that, that the people you were emailing gave you and say, you know what, I'm actually going to sit down and write a novel? Well, I started to kind of maybe believe it a little bit because it just was inundating. I couldn't go out to a pub. I'd be sitting there at the bar and I would have a, you know, I have a, a cigar and then I'd be back when that was legal and, and a beer and whatever and I'd be candid and like I'd just be having a conversation about how you know I was talking about the how 9-11 remind me of the Towers of Babylon the fall of the Towers of Babylon I was making this kind of like you know whimsical sort of back when it was okay to talk like that without insulting somebody you know and um the guy was like god you should write that down dude that's really cool and deep and I never really and that just kind of stuff started to happen to me all the time. I mean, it just was in like, I, I got into, a, I interned with an, a, a local meteorologist, an on-camera guy who's like a fan favorite in this part of the country up here in New England. And after I interned with him, I would write emails back and forth with him for the next several years about dramatic uh, atmospheric events. And he started telling me that I should gather these things. I mean, just, I'm getting this advice from him, you know, who's a broadcaster by nature. And he's telling me that I should try and write something. So I just, I think what was really the catalyst and I to be, if I were to be totally um, revealing, I went through a period of unemployment about two years before I started writing this novel. And I, and I was like, well, you know, maybe I don't want to wake up when I'm 75 years old and, and start writing then. Maybe if I'm going to do this, I should just get around to trying it. And just by serendipity, I happened to watch this program on GBH. that was a really fascinating document uh, documentary about what do all the great science fiction novelists of the last hundred years, because it's a relatively new genre in literature, what do all the greats have in common? And this story did this 
really a uh, really cool they did all these comparison contrasts and they came to this consensus that all of them took the school of whatever the science was at their time and extrapolated a vision of consequence based on the misuse of that technology because most of them at some part of their core didn't believe in the vir the virtuosity of man you know when when having such you know great strokes of power at their, you know, at their disposal. So, you know, I was fascinated by watching this program and it was hot in my mind that I should try to start writing something. And I'm like, I can really do this. And then that same week I was listening to NPR and I, they had this neuroscientist on there talking about these microtubules. And it was just like, you know, it's funny how like reality can kind of like, angle you towards doing something. And I had like these three forms of abstract stimulus coming from just my reality at the time, guiding me to try to start doing this. And really when I started writing it, the story just came out like really pretty quickly within the first, I don't know, three months I had most of it down, but I put it down and I didn't come back to it for like five years and then I finished it. And then uh, when I submitted it, it got accepted. I want to, I mean, is it okay to talk a little about what goes on in the story without, I mean, I don't want to, I don't know no, what you're, we will. Uh, I mean, we, <laughs> we will definitely be asking, but if you want to tell us now, you know, we can, oh, uh, well, yeah, I don't want to, yeah, I just, by going out of order. Well, I, I kind of want to step outside the story and just preface it briefly. There's um, a world renowned physicist. His name is Sir Roger Penrose. And he's recently uh, probably, you know, I don't know if he's actually MRIs. I don't know if he's actually retired, but he's, um, but he is in his 90s, so that would be a safe bet. But about 15 years ago, one of the last papers he put out was a paper. The title of the paper and the content is almost exactly the material that I independently visualized when I created the arc for this story. And I got my flash of insight from listening to an NPR report completely unrelated to his. And then I'm reading, and it was actually my father had read this story before it was published. And he's like, John, you should, you should read this paper by Sir Roger Penrose. Cause he's, you know, he's one of these guys that belongs to science fiction uh, periodicals and stuff forth like that. And he also goes and, and reads like real physics papers and the preprint sites online and so forth. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, and he was. Like yeah, he told me to to gather, and that literally the the title of the story says microtubules. Um, data reveals that microtubules may be instrumental in the emergence of consciousness, and that's that's exactly what my story is centers around a guy that wants to use carbon nanotubes and ultra fine uh, microfibers. Um, um, to basically convey information along an apparatus and, and, and so that he, he thinks he can get these microtubules to vibrate in real time and space and create artificially the delta waves and the alpha waves and the gamma waves that you see on, on those uh, tests, right? On the, and I guess EEG, right? And um, cephalograph. So he does, but he succeeds in doing that. But upon, and upon doing that, you know, he walks, he ends up with the uh, unintended consequences. Like all very complex systems in nature seem to have emergent properties that were not intended. And um, our consciousness, for example, our higher order consciousness is sort of an unintended consequence of our brain's evolution, you know, the complexity of our brain. And, uh, you know, we are, we seem to have the most consciousness out of all the animals on the planet. I'm not saying that that's an absolute observation, but it seems to be any evidence to the contrary, right? But we also have the densest neurodendritic concentration um, per unit volume in gray matter, higher, conf higher, higher convolution level, higher ner nerve density, greater synapse communication and um, more efficiency at those, at those terminuses as well. 
So the microtubules gather with particular density along those along those synapses. And as you know, the brain is an electrochemical device and any kind of a flow of electricity has a corresponding magnetic field. Um, and and then he talks about that in his paper and that's exactly what this novel does. So the reason why I'm telling you this is that this, the fiction, quote unquote, of this story, it bears some possibility in the real you know, real science world, you know, so that's, that. I, it, ga it gave it some relevancy. I'm sorry. That's all I was trying to get to is that stuff. Oh, no, no. But that's also because, you know, you talked about how this is really kind of a hard science. So this is exactly that's right. Where the hard, I mean, typically a lot of people, when we talk about hard science, we're talking not about the, because this is biology. So this is what I call the squishy science. And, um, but a lot of hard science focuses on like um, Mar the Martian and things like that, that are the hard space sciences. So this is kind of neat that you're taking more of a hard science meets biology approach. To yeah, it. Yeah, because, well, he's the, the main kid, the, the story starts out. The main character is a, a college student who's making a second go at a PhD thesis at, thesis <laughs> oh my goodness that's a painful thing what is he gonna doing his phd in well he's a solid state physicist and he he had revolutionized yeah. as an undergrad um he had revolutionized um getting um superconduction closer to room temperature using organic substrates oh very good cool. Yeah, so there's there's some chemistry there for you. Um, oh, yeah, no, JR is so silent right now because he is completely lost. He's like, Wait, that was biology, and and now we're talking physics. I always make sounds when it comes to physics, but that is because I, I have had some very good physics teachers, but I've also had mostly very painful physics teachers. So he so the main the main character he suffers a tragedy in his personal life, which put that put that PhD thesis on hold. Yeah. And so, so he, so the story kind of picks up, picks up at the other end of that um, sabbatical, if you will. And he's taking, he's getting back into it. And he's, he's taking a class and he, he's still gotten electives as, as a, as a graduate student. So he happens to be taking this uh, neuroscience course, uh, neurophysiology course. And it, you know, that's the entry of the story. This, Professor Lombard is his name. It's droning on about, you know, microtubules and, and and the functions that they serve in the in the in neural tapestry of the brain and all this other stuff. He's been using all these all this complicated lingo and everything else. And um, and but you know, Col the Colton Reinhold is the name of the main character. He's actually getting inspired by this while everyone else in the auditorium is trying to pretend like they're not falling asleep. You I've know. had that moment in, in intro in to cell and molecular biology. I'll admit that. Something got really interested and all of a sudden you're like going crazy and you see, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, and everybody else is looking at me going, what are you doing? How are you? <laughs> yeah, like my friend looked at me and goes, how are you still awake? See, that's kind yes. of, that, see, parts of, you were asking me about my character stuff and I think that pieces of the, the Colton's character and pieces of the story are just self-referential maybe, you know? <laughs> this is really like the story where if you are a science person, like a science major, you're going to see some aspect of yourself in this guy. And I think that's I awesome. How, I, don't see how that's, I don't see how you can get away from that, to be honest, as a, you know, Well, I mean, maybe. I think that's awesome, particularly I read so much Mill SF, but not everybody who reads Mill SF can see themselves at uh, parts of themselves in the characters. So I think this is super awesome. JR, of course, probably won't. He is an academic by nature, but um, he's also like a grunty academic, which means math, not his thing. Right, right JR? Pretty much. I mean, I've told the story the one time I... I tried to use math in real life and I accidentally called fire for effect on myself instead of the bad guys. Uh, it was in training people. Nobody died for real. Just the miles gear went off. And that's when I realized that uh, there's a reason I wasn't a mortarman because math sucks. <laughs> so well, you know, I, was never actually, I was never actually good at math myself. It's really more of like I needed to do it to get to where I wanted to be uh, so I could. 
There are points where I have believed math to be a necessary evil, but I also believe that about physics. So, so, no, I, that, yeah, so. I, I was proof to that one, that one geometry teacher. Cause it was the, uh, if I remember correctly, it was a geometric formula that I messed up trying to calculate the, the stuff. And I had, I remember when I went back to do the hometown recruiting and told the teacher, yep, I actually use this for real life. Cause you know, I was the guy when I took math, I'm like, when am I ever going to use this in real life? I was that kid. Oh, see, I cheated, and I remember asking my grandfather, who was a retired artillery officer, and he told me the only reason you need trigonometry in life is to make sure the bombs land where they're supposed to. That's what it was. It was trigonometry. Thank you, Doc. Even the train <laughs> liked you. But yeah, so I was the guy that uh, that messed up the math and bombed himself. So, uh, By the way, my geometry teacher did not like that answer. This is true. This, I, I can understand that. And for those of you who don't know, Miles Gear is basically laser tag for soldiers. I don't know if they use it anymore, but they did when I was in. It was a training thing. Um, they did when I was in. Yeah, we, we you, were would like, you would like this story towards the end, uh, JR, because what this does is it. Um, so the main protagonist gets this idea that he can weave um, fiber optics, uh, extra extra small fiber optics with carbon nanotubes to mimic to mimic the neuro tapestry that the that Lombard is lecturing about, and he adopts he gets into it and he start they do, so the technology evolves over the next several chapters and they create this device and it gets into it gets into drawing towers and and. And how to create the that gets into the lab description and everything else, and what it's like to go out to the lab and go in there and, and go through the clean room and get into the, the suits that they have to be in there for everything. And uh, and what happens is the whole time this is happening is the professor Mendel, who is the academic advisor of the brainchild of the story, is kind of a douche, and he is. He is actually siphoning the intellectual property off this idea because he's got a separate contract with the military to come up with AI technology that's capable of distinguishing Taliban goat herders from Taliban operatives. You know what I mean? Which is not something yeah. that. Uh, so he's failing to do that because it doesn't have the human touch, if you will. But he recognizes before Colton does the significance of what Colton's breakthrough is. And he starts saying, well, I can use this technology to create the AI for these nuclear powered drones. And that's when the story shit hits a fan. So, so to speak. <laughs> so, well, you know, before we get, before we get in too deep, because we're starting to talk specifically just about the book, we're going to pause for a moment while we shamelessly shill for the man, or in this case, the woman. Thanks, Mel. In a world where magic is controlled by law and government, Mages are both coddled and persecuted. Corey Monroe knows she isn't a mage, and her best friend is. Reality isn't always what you know. If you are looking for an urban fantasy with found family, an education-based magic system, and evolving storylines, try My Luck by Mel Todd, book one in the Twisted Luck series. Available exclusively on Amazon. So real quick, because we, we you yeah. talked about this story a little bit. Um, what would the age range that you would say the story is suited for? Like, because some, you know, we've got families that listen. So not all stories are created for kids, right? So what would you say the age range this story is appropriate for? It sounds more like this one might be just able to understand the concepts is the problem rather than just language or violence. Well, that's the thing is I spent the first, um, that's a great, great, Great point you brought that up there. Uh, I spent the first four or so chapters trying to create a story that simultaneously explains the basis for the technology while it conveys the story. So, that good takes luck. Some right? serious, that takes some serious skills. I Yeah, exactly. So that's why I was saying good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it impressed my my publisher said it succeeded. You know, it is it is a tougher read in the first half of the book because of that expose. But then the second half of the book is is fun, more fun resolution and, and dystopian kind of stuff going on, which you know is much more character interactive and like you know, look out here they come kind of stuff. You know, and um, and it has some kind of haunting sort of refrains to it in there too towards the end because of that. You know. Yeah, but a lot of books that have a lot of world building, which in this case, you know, you're not doing world building and describing 
a foreign planet. You're doing world building yeah. and describing tech. A lot of books, when you start a series, have a lot of front end load on the world building. So I think for readers, that's going to be pretty common to understand. It's just, it's going to look a little different than it does for most books because you're the doing in the, Yeah, no, I agree. And the preface in the story does talk about Sir Roger Penrose's science. And so if they read that, that, uh, that preface, it might help also facilitate some of why the story has relevancy going forward from page one. You know? I definitely feel like one of my very good friends who's an army vet would love this because he went on to med school and he was a huge science fiction nerd when we knew each other. So I'm definitely going to have to call him and be like, I'm sending you a book. You're going to read it. I hope he does. And I would love to get his feedback. Um, as an artist, I'm, you know, I'm a rare breed of uh, also effacing with no ego. So I, I actually welcome, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not self, I'm not masochistic. I don't like it to be mean. <laughs> you know? well, constructive. Like, there's a difference. There's constructive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you're not going to be the person who kills his editor in every story as like a minor character. I would consider this story kind of like, you're not going out and doing two shots of Jameson's and pacing it with a, with a, you know, with a Guinness. You're, you're sipping a wine slowly, you know, <laughs> it's kind of a, it's, it's that kind of a story. There's actually, uh, there's actually some, some pretty weighty stuff in there. So, especially in the beginning part of the book. So, yeah, that's kind of what the reviews I've been getting have been pretty good in general. Um, now as a new author, I don't, I wish I had, um, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know how you get your first work to be really popular in that sense. So I yeah. have no idea. I, I wish I did. I could patent yeah. it and sell it. So, but I, I think you just kind of got to let it you know what most of the authors i know who really did well and had that book book one that just took off it wasn't really their book one it was just their book one for whatever new series that they'd done and they finally managed to find yeah. the right readers so but it takes time to find the right readers and hopefully our audience has some of those right readers in there and you'll somebody will pick it up and go oh my god i love this and never put it down again so you speaking know, of loving this and getting someone to not put it down, what would your 30-second elevator pitch for Dominion be? My 30-second elevator pitch would be, you know, picture a story where AI, did anybody ever ask the question of whether you're turning on a soul if you're making something self-aware? And if you're turning on a soul, who takes ownership of that spirit? Because okay. maybe that maybe that device doesn't want the lights turned off at the end of the night. Something well, like that. That might be that might like be ten seconds. I don't know, but <laughs> I will take it. It works. It's deep. Um, so, all right, that's a, that's a good one. So, what do you think makes Dominion special in all of the world's books of hard sci-fi? Uh, what do you think makes yours stand out? Well. I think two things, the A, that it sort of independently converged on the same science that Sir Roger Penrose and et al. Had, are, are sciencing right now, that microtubules seem to be responsive to magnetic field oscillations, and the vibrations of those oscillations seem to be instrumental in the emergence of consciousness. The fact that an independent author was able to you know, come up with the same idea in a pure fantasy sort of, or, or imaginative sort of setting and write a story around that. I don't, for some reason, that seems like it should, maybe has more relevancy to me than it does to anybody else. I don't know, but I think that's significant. But um, the other thing is that what stands out about it is that it's really kind of a return back to like, that GBH program of taking the science of today and extrapolating a vision, it's kind of getting back to that because my publisher will, will tell, tell you this too, that he constantly gets these manuscripts 
of science fiction. He's reading it and it just sounds like like corny fantasy. It doesn't sound like science fiction. And he's like, where is all the science fiction? You know? And that's what he said attracted me about this story is that it really sticks to the framework of using solid state physics to mimic biological and uh, biological function and then it then explores the ramifications of psycho it's kind of like psychosciences i'm gonna pretend i know what any of that means and uh oh no i'm sorry i thought i was being really clear too <laughs> I'm you, don't worry, don't worry. you are being very clear to anybody possibly other than jr but you should probably like give up somebody i know we have I know Nick's going to listen to this episode, and he doesn't know what psychosciences means. I just meant psychological sciences. I was just being, uh, I was just using a brief. <laughs> I okay. understood. Because well, I, yeah, I, guess, I guess it'd be more like, yeah. This I is guess it's obviously more. like, this is, this is my version of every episode where JR has a history nerd on, and they're talking about stuff. And Dead I'm like, people. you guys don't even know the math for carbon dating, but okay. So like I, I was the kid. I history is fascinating, though. I like, I watch a lot of history. I think that's fascinating. It so, is, but it's just funny to watch Jr. try and do it. Huh. So so back to his book. Uh, what tropes do you feel like Dominion hits the best? Tropes. Um, well, it's a pretty unique story. I'm not trying to. I'm really not trying to be evasive, but I don't. I didn't rely on any kind of tropes. I mean, this is literally taking fiber optics and carbon nanotubes and and creating something that looks just like the human brain to try and recreate alpha waves on an EEG scan and then inadvertently stumbling into a lot a whole you know realm of like consequences so maybe that's the trope is the arc the arc of dabbling yeah that's the trope you, that's a great question that's the trope the trope if it's a true one to call it that because tropes kind of a negative connotation isn't it i don't know but um trope in the sense that it dabbles in powers that you don't know you know that kind of thing where like you don't know the significance of what it is that you're dealing with you know i think it borrows i love that right. you know that be be careful what you do because the, the right. AI cl classic trope that can come out. And I don't think trope is negative. Trope can be negative if all you're doing as an is reading a book that relies on one trope after another. Well, I think, yeah, I, I knew what he meant. I could just, so, just but it, like <laughs> you definitely have that AI trope, which I think is great in here of how do you create consciousness and that AI sentient trope. And I always love them. Um, I actually name all my computers after AIs in science fiction. Well, because, you know, that's a great point you just made because, well, it it makes me think that, like, usually when I'm watching uh, in the AI subgenre of science fiction, you're always picking it up with the AI already exists. You yeah, know what I mean? That is what's really neat about this because it's... This is the zygote of the, of the AI. This is... I, like, I, I almost feel like you're channeling your inner Nietzsche. So uh, with his famous quote, if, uh, if you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back to you or back into you, or I'm paraphrasing badly probably, but but I, I sense a little bit of that in your take on the uh, in the AI, like the unintended consequences. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, there's a series of dialogue, I think in the chapter, in the chapter three or four of the story where, or maybe it was later on. Um, oh, you know, it's later on in the book. I'm sorry. I shouldn't do that. I should just let the reader, but. It's basically where, you know, complex, if you look at everything that's complex in nature, it always has a secondary series of what we call emergent properties. And so he succeeds at crossing that threshold just because of his genius he, and his brilliant idea of what he wants to construct using solid state physics and mimicking those biological processes. He inadvertently opens this, you know, opens this door to this realm of, uh, you know, I'm going to use that word again, psychoscientific kind of, you know, ramifications of it. Maybe it's more parapsychology is probably a better, better word for it too, you know, because, you know, when, the, when this device gets turned on, you got to understand it, a human baby is born within a square mouth rage for a reason. 
it's because the entire universe is flooding into their five senses. These senses are like the USB ports that connect us to reality. And having no prior frame of reference, all of that's going into the infant child the minute they cross out of, you know, into opening. And that's got to be one of the most abject, terrifying things that you're ever going to experience in your life is what happens right in that moment. So what's going to happen when they create this device and turn on the power? Right? You, yeah. When sentience finally emerges in AI, are we even going to know that we've done it? You know, I mean, it just really, there's so many crazy questions that you can really venture when you start thinking about this at a more philosophical or kind of an ownership level, you know? So this device senses you, senses, if you're around it, it senses you as a life force. It's kind of like almost imagining a dim, pale orbs of light and a, and a black abyss. You mentioned staring in the abyss and that's like, that's gave me goosebumps when you said that, right? <laughs> so it's, it's like these orbs of light and a black abyss and it reaches out and it, it, it tries to communicate with these these orbs of light because it's you know trying to figure out where what its place in the cosmos is but whenever it does that it grabs a hold of you and it's basically like a possession at that point the person's eyes roll back in their head and they go into a coma and they start talking in tongues and all this other stuff and all it is is because this device and they don't know that's happening right away you know what I mean it's because it's an, it's all happening by accident right <laughs> you follow? Mm -hmm. So, right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's it's simultaneously talking, like exploring the consequences of of doing meddling and things that you don't, you know. <laughs> maybe so be all of so, hold on, Doc. Real quick. So, do you go into proving the sentience with like a Turing test or your version of it, if you if you don't use that terminology? No. This is the beauty of it. I kept it. I kept it so that nobody knows what's going on except for Colton and his sidekick. It's awesome. I love it. this is the way to do it. You know what I mean? That way, you know, and believe me, everything that happens in the consequence resolution in this story can only be explained <laughs> one way, right? But they, but they, the story, I think, reason I tried to be clever about how I got away from having to get into that kind of, you know, there's no like one on one with a device or anything like that. Um, Basically, as they turn the thing on, the the author or the author <laughs> the authors mean when they turn the thing, when they turn the device on, Colton starts getting these headaches right away, and they don't know what the headaches are for because it's just a primitive attempt for the device to reach out, but and it's communicating psionically because that's part of the emergent property of this complex device is that it communicates telepathically, sort of with with these orbs of light that it senses around it. I'm speaking like from the perspective of the device once it's got power, once it's turned on. And so, you know, they don't go, Colton and Jack, who's his, who's his sidekick, they figure out what's probably this thing is doing towards the end of the book with Karen, who's the girlfriend of Jack. And she's actually, a, uh, uh, she's actually a postdoc um, psychology uh a person at the same institution that they're at and so she's like helping them you realize what you're talking about is this and they're like no we didn't we didn't realize and she's like oh my god she's like the thing is naming itself are you serious i mean there's like these kind of poignant scenes like that towards the end um in the dialogue so, and, so don't um, give up too too much to, don't give away the milk for free entirely. Let's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I know. Oh no, no, no. It, I am fascinated by this, which so I. It's really hard for me to be like, no, stop. Don't tell me everything, because I'm I'm so ADHD. I'll get the spoilers and then forget that they were spoilers. Um. So. Well, yeah. So. But, well, that's. So it sounds like there is definitely a cast of characters. So. Yeah. Did you pull from people you knew going to school and in the sciences to create these characters? No, honestly, I really, I didn't really do that. Like, you know, if I could go back to JR's trope question a little bit, like the, um, the, 
Colonel, Colonel McFadden is a, is, was a, is a critical character in the military that's sort of inter, interactive in the story a little bit. Um, he's more with Mendel and Mendel's cahoots. And um, he's, he's got, you know, he's described as kind of a square jawed, tall man with amulets on his jaw. I mean, so he looks kind of military esque, you know what I mean? So the story, you know, the characters in the story, the physical makeup of the characters might be a little bit like, or Dr. Mendo's a little strange. He's bald with a big black goatee, you know, but I figured that was kind of a menacing look. So that just kind of hit me that that's what this guy looks like. You know, assholes tend to look like, look like themselves, right? I mean, that's usually, you know, <laughs> well, it's true. I know. I don't know what it is. I mean, whenever I've met them, met a real, like a real definitive asshole in life, I'm like, wow, that person actually looks like an asshole, you know? <laughs> So do you have so Mendel's kind of your your villain of the story? Yeah, he's uh he he I would consider that to be the villain of the story. Um he's um You've like I said, he was failing with he was he was failing with the military and then he's like reading um he's reading Colton's prospectus over a cognac up in his private lodge and he's like man and you know it's like he's like wow that son of a bitch actually figured out how to you know he's like Without giving it a, giving it away, you know you, you can tell that his processing is is that like you know he needs this thing you know, and then he goes so, to the. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I, yeah, what he, I was he goes. Say is, what is G? It sounds like this has a very open end. But is it an open end because you plan on continuing it, or is it an open end because you just want the readers to stay up at night trying to predict their own ending? Well, I did leave a couple of um, I wouldn't call them cliffhangers, but maybe hooks in the end there. Um, um, like there's a scene where Jack and uh, see I can't it's a, tell you, I have to start describing some of that. I but you I, can just tell us: Do you are you wanting to write? book two of the same universe. I do, but I don't, I do, but I, I, I just, um, I just don't know where it would go from the way this thing ended. Honestly. Um, it's, it's, uh, I think it, I think it's going to have something to do with, um, Colton because Colton meets this woman in the course, over the course of the story, her name is Monica and she's, you know, they end up at the very, very end of it. One of the last scenes. I mean, it's it's like it's sort of implied that she might be pregnant with his child, and I'm wondering if that child somehow inherits the wind, if you will. And I mean that in a spiritual sense. Uh, that oh. would be kind of cool. <laughs> oh, I'm going to tell people on behalf of you because you are new to, new to telling people this. If you want him to write book two, which I already want him to write book two, and I haven't even bought the book yet, then you need to go review it, buy it, tell, give it, give a copy of it to a friend, and make sure that he knows that you want this, because he definitely needs to finish it, if only just so that I'm happy. <laughs> so, so basically, Doc is saying she's special. She's all that matters. Help her out, people. And leave a review. <laughs> you know, if it works, it works, man. I feel you. I feel you. So, wow. Uh, we went way afield and out of order with all the questions. You were all over the place, and I was totally digging it. Um, I'm sorry. So that's, that's my fault. No, I'm a, no, 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 no. That is not a bad thing. It is always good when somebody can keep JR on his toes because Lord knows the calorie burns good for him. <laughs> um, so you you did you did make your uh, your characters have a have unique experiences, but you know he's also an academic. So if your characters met you in a dark alley and they knew that you were the John L. Ford who uh, created the their torment, how do you see that playing out? Do they just buy you a beer and wax philosophical, or do they punch you in the face? I think Jack would have some. Uh, Jack might have some uh, tough words for me. I don't think he'd be violent, but since uh, um, just knowing who Mendel's character is, he probably wouldn't be in the dark alley in the first place. Um, <laughs> That's a good answer. No one's ever said that one before. Um, but uh, Colonel McFadden wouldn't be there, but he, 
um, the Monica character would be um, trying to probably, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think, you know, Jack would, but Colton would probably just be standing, standing there. And then as soon as Jack got done with his diatribe, his little rant, you know, you know this, this, and the other thing, Colton would start asking me questions that I wanted to explore in the story further, but I, you know, for the curious, for the sake of continue getting the story to move along and brevity and that thing, you got to be concise too. I, uh, I had to, you know, I couldn't go any further. Like, um, you would start to ask questions about the ethereal plane, if you will, and is the spirit or the soul actually just the construct of the, you know, of the happenstance of higher, higher intelligence or is it somehow higher intelligence is channeling something about um energy from that psionic energy if you will from that ethereal plane and and what we personify as our spirit in real life is basically a projection of that you know we're basically we're just movie projectors and we're actually projecting that from a from a different ethereal plane i think colton would want to get into that kind of philosophy a little bit but he's also a genius physicist he's very mathematical so i'm not sure i'd actually have to think about how he would engineer his questions because it would be an engineering process with him <laughs> you know yeah i don't know is that, okay. the, is that a good answer <laughs> works for me it's a great answer so you mentioned <laughs> you know some of the downfalls of potentially turning an ai on that's sentient so uh, in the real world, if that technology became available tomorrow, do you tell them to flip the switch or leave it off? Leave it off. Okay, absolutely. you and Elon Musk. Uh, absolutely, leave it off. Leave it off until, you know, you can get some kind of... Three um, laws of robotics you know, in there? Well, you know, that's an actually a good question, that whole thing with the uh, three laws in Asimov, but... See, that, again, picks up AI once it already exists. You know, this story talks about the ramifications of turning it on and not knowing that you've turned it on. And once it's turned on, you don't know what the nature of that sentience really is. And is it going to be self-preserving? Ooh, there's a good question. What if the first thing it senses is its own vulnerability and it's got psionic power? You don't know. What's it going to do? Is it going to be like Scanners? Remember that sci-fi movie from the 70s where, you know, somebody get pissed off at you and they can make your head explode? <laughs> I haven't you know? thought of that movie in a long time. Oh, that's a great – had one of Mike Ironhide's, Michael Ironhide's first movies. That was a really good one. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen it. You've never but. seen Scanners? Oh, yeah. come on. Yeah. It's like <laughs> – so, Doc, we're going to have to make a list of for movie reviews, also potentially doing some of the classic movies of sci-fi. Yeah. Uh, that could yeah. be interesting. Well, a, so lot of those, a lot of those movies were written, were books first. I mean, why not? You know, I mean, you could probably wouldn't take a lot of research to connect the dots there, too. <laughs> probably. Yeah, but not the research that's fun for me. So, uh, so you, you don't have aliens in this story, but as a writer, if you were creating aliens or fantastical creatures, uh, how do you think you'd go about doing that? Would you uh, use Mother Nature as an inspiration? Would you lose folklore, your nightmares, or would you make something up completely out of, you know, whole cloth? It would probably be nature, Mother Nature, because that's sort of just native to my my being is that. This is gonna this is gonna sound really strange, but I'm a realist. <laughs> right. I mean, I can't. I don't like you know. I don't stray too far into the fantasy because I think it drops off of what is could actually happen. I like to have an element of possibility or plausibility in my in what it is that I my imagination, you know, such that if I'm creating a you know like a storyline. The reader could like, like, here's an example, the movie Jaws, right? The first one, well, not all those second and third and fourth idiotic ones, but the first Jaws movie was an excellent film, wonderfully done. And it wasn't a horror story. 
which is what it was labeled for. It was a science fiction story. You know, you've got this anomalously large shark that's developed a taste for human flesh and it's staked a claim off of, you know, Martha's Vineyard. That's not, there are, there are great white sharks around the waters of New England now because of, you know, climate change and so forth. Another reason, also they saved the seal population and that helped draw them up too, but it's another story. But my point is, is that, I mean, there's a, there's a feasibility or plausibility to that story that makes it not impossible. So there might be a little personal bias. So when I say it's a great movie, I'm, I'm just saying that like, for me, it is because it has that overarching sense of, you know, this could actually happen, you know, something like this. You could have a freak. Why not? Right. You have, you have like uh, Robert Wadlow was a nine foot, was an eight foot, 11 inch human being. Can you imagine walking into a, seeing somebody who's eight feet, 11? Who's to say that a, a great white shark can't grow to be 30 feet long and, and four tons, you know, just some shark with a pituitary case. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So uh, as this interview winds down, was there anything about Dominion that you wanted to tell us that we didn't think to ask that, that you think the readers would want to know? No, I'm actually kind of uh, feeling a little ashamed and regretful that I didn't let you ask the questions because I, I, uh, oh, I no, just no, sort no, of laughed and no, <laughs> talked. No, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We, I think it's more fun when we have an entire discussion where you are yeah. excited and we have we have the this, the questions outlined so that we hit everything that we know our listeners like to hear and that we know you're we want to hear from you as readers as well. So as long as we get answers to them, we don't care when it order. Okay. Maybe JR cares, but that's just the head drama speaking. <laughs> the only thing I will add to that in direct response to JR is I really want, if people are interested in reading this story, it's only 300 pages. It's not going to hurt you. You know, just do it. Right. I mean, if it's 300 pages, it, <laughs> but please read the preface and try to understand that, that, there's actual real science in the real world that sort of corroborates the fiction of this novel. So it's not so fictional anymore. So that's, it, it succeeds in the Jaws framework of creating something that's feasible or plots that maybe something like this could happen, you know, and this explores how accidentally creating those vibrations of, my, of carbon nanotubes and the right frequencies using magnetic fields, you know, oops, <laughs> Right. So if they if they understood the research of Roger Roger Penrose and um, and so forth, that it just it really it might give the story some gravitas, if you will, a little bit. OK, plus, and, uh, plus it's just it's cool. You know, I mean, there's like it's like, it takes place in the Arizona desert and it's like really cool. Like it talks about the, the scenery really nicely. I think it's descriptive. You know, talks about lightning dancing along the the uh, cumulative. Well, lightning in the Arizona desert desert is a one of a kind experience. Speaking of one of a kind experience, dear listener, please remember that you have a vital part to play in the book process. So please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right books find the right readers. And rumor has it, if uh, if an author gets his hundredth review, his hundredth star on Amazon that uh, he gets a unicorn. And I, for one, would like to know what a unicorn steak tastes like. So let's do our part, people, so we can, we can you know, do this for science. Bravo. So, all right, John, can you tell listeners and viewers how they can find you? Um, find. Go ahead. I heard an um. No, no, no. <laughs> how can they find you, John? What do you mean by find me? I am like... Online. Online. How do we find you? Oh, I actually, I'm only listed through, on Facebook, I have a, um, I do, I don't, uh, shoot, what is the, what is that? Oh, boy. I can't remember off the top of my head. I don't, I had it and I just lost it. Um, I do have a Facebook um, uh, page there, but also you can find me, go to rockhillpublishing.com and you can get my, write my bio there. Um We'll, uh... Okay, we are. We have definitely stumped this guy. <laughs> it is late in the day, and so we when we're recording this audience, and so we have.
definitely stumped him. But we will put all the appropriate links in the show notes so that you can find it and go get this book. Absolutely. And you can find us, speaking of stumping people, uh, Doc got a little confused by this one, but you can find us on Twitter at twitter.com backslash SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Hey, hey, Sierra Fox. Are. What's that? What, what is one third squared? One third squared is there, see, now um, you can shush and go back to doing your thing. It's it's 42. Um, so twitter.com backslash sf underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra, that's, Fox, a, great, Fox, that's a great answer from the from the galaxy. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. I have my moments. Uh, or so Sierra, yeah, Fox, so if there is a there is a, a, a thing here on me and my at rockhillpublishing.com. Um, it's if the um, if you want the website is rockhillpublishing.com slash john dash l dash ford uh dot html i mean if you just okay. enter that or if you just go to rocko publishing and then select the authors you can get there's a bio in there on me if they want um okay and you can uh, you can get us on Twitter at uh, sf underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email us at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. We promise we answer. We have a Facebook group where all the shenanigans happen at facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. Again, backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. We do have that Facebook page. Go follow it so it can get its own dedicated URL, but it is there as blasters and blades podcast. Finally, we do have a website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tack and tack blades again anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades where for as little as 99 cents a month you can help keep the lights on uh you can also support the show more directly at buymeacoffee.com backslash author jr hanley again buymeacoffee.com backslash author jr hanley be sure to put in the comment section that's for the podcast and i promise i will keep my co-hosts doc seska and nick garber duly caffeinated they will drink until their liver surrenders <laughs> hey you know what guys definitely keep in touch um you know email or whatever um, it was great great uh, meeting you and it's a wonderful discussion so i thank you for this opportunity all right and with that note doc bring us home Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us, John, and our audience. Uh, for the absentee Nick Garber, for the addle-brain J.R. Handley, who had to deal with way more math tonight than he is used to in a probably week-long period, not even 48 hours. I'm Seska. This was the Blasters and Blazes podcast. We'll be back next week. Same time, same place, enjoying our love of cheesy jokes, nerd culture, books, sci-fi, fantasy, and of course, making J.R. remember that math is a thing. One day he will learn how to do formulas. Nice.